six decades of artistic output serve as a comprehensive roadmap revealing the development of consciousness through artistic endeavors. This exhibition is a depiction of my own spiritual journey, the alchemical work of an artist engaged in an ongoing process of self-transformation. It is my lifetime's work. The artifacts of this sacred endeavor are the objects left behind, the works of art. And what is art, anyway? The word art means to be, as in, thou art. So, these are works of being, of becoming. They are works of art that are made from the dross, effervescent materials of this relativistic, changing world, inextricably and magically imbued with the unchanging, eternal, transcendental, divine world of pure being. That, after all, is the shamanic work of the artist, to bring the infinite into the limited relative world of boundaries and contrast, to guide people's attention toward the spontaneous experience of pure beauty, pure transcendence, if even for just the briefest instant. That is enough to be transformational. They're artifacts of my journey. They're examples of spiritual aesthetic explorations using a wide variety of media and technique. The styles presented are varied and inconsistent, yet the driving focus and intention has always been there, to evoke and embody the enlightened soul and radiate that light through these sacred space experiences. It's a sharing of the somatic infinite bliss from which time and space emerge. It's a sharing and celebration of pure creation. This is the entrance to the show. This is the first thing you see when you enter. It's a large photo field called The Curious Rainbow Speaks. It's one of about 15 different photo fields that are scattered throughout the show. We'll go look at some of them in a minute. This show is a six decade retrospective starting in 1964 and going up until the present and it covers a wide variety of different kinds of work. For the last 15 or 20 years, I've focused primarily on the photo field work, as well as the sketchbook journals. But as you'll see, there are many other different kinds of work in, in this show. Michael has enthusiastically surfed the waves of creativity and consciousness his whole life. He's been seeking the self and enlightenment. I'm going to now give an interpretation of his work in the light of consciousness. It may not be exactly what Michael intended, but often artists express unconsciously deeper values of life. Also, my interpretation may not be yours. Just see if it resonates with you and helps you understand his work. Here's my interpretation. One way to look at his work is it's about the coexistence of opposite values and the interplay of those values. He has sought to integrate, for example, the absolute and the relative, change and non-change, parts and whole, boundaries and unboundedness into a greater wholeness of life. 
the Curious Rainbow Speaks is like many of the other photo fields. The images are from widely spread out geographic locations. This Tibetan flag image is from the 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica where I've had, had my studio for many, many years. This is from a wedding in Malibu on the beach. That one back there is from Maui. This is from Cape Cod. It's a bunch from Malibu, Culver City, all over the place. And that's how most of these photo fields happen. I take images at all different times and places, and then I often would make prints of the images, pin them up on a large wall in my studio, and then they'd slowly find each other. And eventually, maybe it'd be a year or maybe two or three years, an array of images would come together that would really work and have a kind of story and narrative and wholeness. Occasionally, I'll shoot something and know that a whole bunch of images that I've shot very much together are um, going to be a photo field. For instance, the piece back there, it was done in Santa Fe, en route from Santa Fe to Albuquerque. All those images are like a time lapse of the drive from Santa Fe to Albuquerque. And then it's surrounded by other images from other places. I kind of knew when I was photographing that, that they would go together as part of an array. I didn't know how ultimately it would work, but I did understand that and I felt it and it did work out that way. That's a fairly recent one. But now, why don't we go to the next room and I'll show you more of the photo fields and some of the other work too. So in this room, it's mostly photo fields. These are photo fields from many different uh, eras, starting back before 2000. This one, Codex Mysterium, was shot primarily in Venice, Italy. This one image on the upper right is from Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia. Um, what's interesting about this one, which was completed in 2000, is that it's prior to the use of Photoshop and digital printing. So these are photographic prints that were shot on film and then cut and mounted. And so there's nine separate prints that make up this piece. In this work, we see an interplay, kind of a dialogue between 2D and 3D. Some parts of it are mainly two-dimensional, yet a deep kind of three-dimensionality is back in some of the images. For instance, look at that mysterious portal of light. The cards on a table also give an idea of three-dimensionality. And what do cards suggest? Playing cards. It suggests a game. It suggests that this life and this artwork, the whole thing is an illusion. It reminds me of the illusion of reality in the movie The Matrix. In the Vedic understanding, Maya is the illusion of creation that hides the ultimate absolute reality. This could be, you know, a subliminal kind of reference to this deeper uh, understanding of the world. The next piece I want to show you is first light, first breath, first sound. What's interesting is we just talked about Codex Mysterium, which was done around 2000. This was completed in 2018, and it's an example of an all digital uh, print, both in terms of the photography and the final printing. It's archival inkjet printing um, using Photoshop to combine the elements. But the process of making it remains much the same as it did back when they were separate prints. The images here are from Zuma Beach, Baja, Mexico, Malibu, Santa Monica, Culver City, and Fairfield, Iowa. And again, these are images that somehow found their way together and made a whole and made a kind of narrative, which many of these have. This next group of images are from the 1990s and 2000s. The two pieces on each side are layers of 
plexiglass, glass, gold leaf, thread, photographs, paint, all in a very solid wood frame. And I did a whole series of these. I like these because they give a whole different kind of experience of when you look at them, the layers and the dimensionality allow your mind to kind of go into this space, this kind of sacred space, in a different way than in a, a more flat painting or photograph. And I like that, and I think it's, it's a kind of unusual, involving experience. I'd like to do more of these. The centerpiece is um, called The Mechanics of Creation, and it's an example of the works I've done in Scratchboard. Scratchboard is a kind of board with a clay surface and then generally with India ink painted over that. And you draw into the India ink with a needle or other sharp implement and you kind of are drawing in reverse. The, you reveal the white, the highlights instead of the shadows as you would normally. And this piece is very detailed. It took about three years to do. I took this with me when I travel to shoot commercials or films and work on it when I had an off evening or whatever. And after three years, it was finally done. It's also gold leaf and then gouache. Um, and I see these three spiral images, which show up in a lot of my work over the years. In this case, they kind of mean to me the representation of the three gunas, the three fundamental forces of creation. There's the creative force, the sustaining force, and the destructive force. And these all are intertwined throughout all of creation and have different balances at different times. And they're what make the world that we experience. And then the black ground and with the spirals going into that black ground, I sort of see that as pure, absolute being, unmanifest, just pure consciousness, out of which all of this manifests. So that's the kind of thing I was thinking about, along with physics and the vacuum state and how particles emerge out of the vacuum state. Involvement of the ideas about randomness and chaos as an element in that and also the ideas about the interaction of the observer with what's being observed and the observer changing what happens while they're observing it. In other words, the act of observing is actually a kind of creative act in and of itself. And all of that is very interesting to me and I think very relevant to the art experience, the experience of beauty, the experience of transcendence, and also just life in general. I do think the mechanics of what we experience as our lives have a lot to do with all of these subjects that I'm dealing with in this piece and the others as well. So let's talk about the next photo field. Uh, this is one that I did in Bali in 2015. This is called Rising Light Over the China Sea. And this was taken in 2015 en route to Bali at about 30,000 feet at sunrise. I would like to see this much bigger someday. It's, uh, this one right now is about 40 inches by 60 inches. And it's nice this size, but it would be nice to see it really big. It's uh, slightly different than many of the other ones since it's just images from one moment, essentially, not disparate images brought together. But I do like that sense of time passing from when it's pre-dawn through the dawn and just as the sun is beginning to come up. And I think that's part of what many of these photo fields have in common is a kind of cinematic sensibility of time passing. And um, I like that. I, I, I think it's interesting and I think it gives people a little bit of a story, a little narrative to latch on to and explore. Amazingly, Michael photographed these images in real time. They are not manipulated in the darkroom or by Photoshop. I kept returning to this work again and again uh, when I was 
visiting the show, and I was asking myself why. So let's take a let's take a close look at it. We see a seemingly unbounded sky over an equally unbounded ocean, where the two meet. Celestial colors emanate and dance. Where the two meet is called the finest level of relative creation, which is closest to the absolute source. This level is said to radiate celestial light, just as in this artwork we see the light radiating there. This work may give us a glimpse of the glorious light of refined cosmic consciousness, where everything is illuminated by the transcendental light of God. Let's look at one work that encapsulates Michael's imagination. It's called the Red Board Topanga, and it was done in 2001. Michael is an avid surfer. We can easily interpret this work as a mirror of his consciousness. Michael has been practicing the transcendental meditation technique for quite a while. He has learned to transcend the surface level of consciousness, sense perceptions and thinking, and go to a deeper level that is silent, pure, and unbounded. We're going to see this reflected in this work. The upper half of this artwork evokes the unboundedness of the ocean, while the frame and the lines define boundaries. The surfer can embody the artist's awareness, and also our awareness. Note the surfer is both inside and outside the frame. He rides the waves of unboundedness within the boundaries of the body, the boundaries of space and time. In a way, this is a description of a higher state of consciousness. Marshy has described cosmic consciousness, where the pure awareness is a silent witness to all activity. And in fact, Michael, when I mentioned this interpretation to him, said that surfers in peak moments can experience their awareness as if behind and above them, looking on as they cascade through these incredible, uh, incredibly powerful waves. Let's look at one work that encapsulates Michael's imagination. It's called County Line Hurricane Swell, and it was done in 2011. Here we see Michael surfing at two moments uh, in time but he's riding, the surfer's riding the waves, the unbounded waves that we talked about before. In one frame, he's within the frame, and in the other one, he's jutting slightly outside of the frame. But notice the gold background. It seems kind of unnatural to have a gold background like that. What it made me think of is in Western art, gold usually symbolizes heaven, and this could be when the surfer is at that peak moment of experience that we described before, it's the closest he gets to heaven on earth. Now I want to look at some of Michael's photography. But first, let's, let's take a glimpse at the man who inspired him. Michael's father, John W. Barnard, created mesmerizing photographs that are reminiscent of Ansel Adams. This building possesses a crystal-like clarity while evoking the spiritual presence of being. In another work, the towering cloud suggests limitlessness. Now let's move on to one of Michael's photographs. Inspired by his father, Michael experimented with photography. In 1964, he did self-portrait in a dark room in this work, he creates a startling self-image. The self is seen as the light in the darkness. And here we see the beginnings of Michael's preoccupation with uh, the nature of the self. Much later, Michael created sophisticated photo collages like this one, which is called Autumn Field of Quantum Creation, done in 2000. Here we see the ocean suggests the infinite, but also the road stretching towards the horizon. Whereas the light below suggests the transcendent. You know, light is often a symbol of consciousness and the transcendent aspect of consciousness. And we see the faces of the people are defined, but their boundaries are beginning to dissolve into the light. Individuality is becoming more expanded, more universal. 
In 2017, Michael created Field of All Possibilities Activated. This work has many traditional symbols in it. For instance, the moon and the flowers are symbols of the feminine and also of cycles of time. We know the moon goes through cycles, flowers decay over time. In this, we see Mahalakshmi, the red garb figure. Mahalakshmi is a goddess or a force of nature who bestows affluence, fullness of life, both spiritual and material. The offerings in this work signal spiritual devotion and ritual. Notice that this piece is framed by flames, by fire. This reminds me of the flames that surround some deities in Eastern art. For instance, think of the Shiva Nataraj, the dancing Shiva. And in the Shiva Nataraj, these flames symbolize transcendental wisdom, the wisdom that burns away ignorance. Overall, this photo collage integrates opposites. We see organic symbols from nature, like the flower, with a geometric grid that could only be generated by human intelligence. The grid brings the uh, concept of boundaries, while the sky opens up unboundedness. Let's look at another one of Michael's photo collages called Quantum Wave Slash Particle Fugue Right, which he did in 2003. The title refers to the scientific discovery that physical objects are simultaneously both particles and waves. And we see a wave at the center of this image surrounded by photos of trees and water. It's the same tree. Michael took these uh, photographs over a two year period. And we see subtle changes in light as well as seasons. This might remind us of Monet's painted series of wheat stacks. In America, they're called haystacks, but they're actually wheat stacks, where he painted the same scene at different times of day. Through experiencing work like this, the artist and the viewer can refine their perception. Monet said, quote, the more I paint nature, the more I learn about myself. And I think this has been part of Michael's aspiration as well. There's a significant difference between Monet's series and Michael's series. And that is that in Monet's paintings, we only see one at a time. We experience them separately. In Michael's work, we see all the scenes together in one frame. For me, this suggests that all time, past, present, and future could be cognized at once. In such a state of consciousness, the whole is found in every part, yet the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This is a good principle to understand Michael's photo collages because each scene is complete, like each photograph of this tree is complete within itself, yet all of them are experienced together in this work, and that creates a greater all-encompassing wholeness of experience. So these paintings up here are from very early in my career. The two on either side of Rembrandt were done when I was in high school. And you know, I, I, I grew up on Cape Cod to a large extent. And all, kind of all the most important things in my early life happened there. The whole area of that part of the Cape, the Outer Cape, Provincetown, Truro, Wellfleet, East End, is saturated with artists and poets and writers. And my very first job was as an attendant at this gas station, which this is a very famous Edward Hopper painting. When I worked there, it was uh, Jack Sesso. In the painting, it's mobile, I think it's a mobile station. Edward Hopper lived on the other hill beyond where we lived. And then he did another painting of Corn Hill, and before we actually owned a house on Cape Cod, we rented a house on Corn Hill, we rented this house right here, and I would go there in the summers. Um, now Corn Hill, the reason it's called Corn Hill is because when the pilgrims came, before they landed at Plymouth, they landed out in Provincetown and Truro, and they had to spend a winter there, and they were starving, and they discovered a cache of buried corn that the uh, 
Native Americans had left there, the Pamet Indians, and that allowed them to survive. And uh, it was found right near Corn Hill, which is an estuary where the Pamet River is. And this painting over here was done quite near there. That's a hill behind my aunt's house. And many important things happened for me and all of my brothers and relatives adjacent to this hill. This work evokes Michael's lifelong yearning for unboundedness. How does it do this? Here we see a faceless young girl looking out over an expansive, empty, and mysterious landscape. She's anonymous. That suggests universality. She could be anybody. We could be her. The horizon line behind her seems to stretch out forever in both directions. This is where the unboundedness comes in. Because horizon lines in Western art have symbolized traditionally eternity, limitlessness. This painting was done later. It's um, maybe a year later, and it's really of Santa Cruz, where my dad was born and where my grandfather was staying in a old folks home, and I'd go sometimes and pick him up and take him for a drive and bring him back to San Mateo where we lived. And there was a uh, nunnery nearby, and I saw these nuns one day walking, and it stayed with me, so I did that painting. So my beginnings as an artist really have their roots in Truro on Cape Cod and are mixed with all of this other art world, but also the land, um, the lives of the people who uh, we had lived with, but who came before us, the whalers and fishermen. In my dad's photographs, there's a photograph of my great uncle on his fishing boat out on Cape Cod Bay. And then the center piece is another scratchboard piece. I was fascinated by Rembrandt. And in 1967, I went to uh, London. And I went to the National Gallery specifically to see the self-portrait of Rembrandt. And this piece came out of that. It, it's a scratchboard piece with acrylic paint. It's called Portrait of Rembrandt's Self-Portrait. And it was done in 1966 in Oakland where I, while I was still at art school. And I really love this piece. It really captures something of the energy of, of this artist at the end of his career. And it's especially poignant for me now because I'm probably about the same age as he was when he painted that self-portrait. Um, and uh, the connection is even deeper than it ever was before. Let's look together now at one of the most poignant, for me, pieces in this exhibit. It's called Prodigal Son, The Forgetfulness of Returning, which Michael created in 2004. And it presents the passage of time through the recurring image of a gondola in Venice. Sometimes we see the whole gondola, sometimes just a part. The title has many references. First, the prodigal son is a parable from the New Testament where a son goes off into the world, gets lost in a way, and then eventually comes back home to be welcomed by his family. And I asked Michael about this piece because I found it so intriguing. And he said that the title refers to his own returning to Venice, which he's been to many times, and to the self. For him, Venice is the most feminine of cities. For him, it's a manifestation of the Divine Mother and exalted creativity. The gondola for him has echoes of the ancient Greek story that a ferryman ferried souls across the river Styx to the afterworld. And in the afterworld, in the afterlife, they would then have an opportunity to choose their next lifetime. Now notice that almost all the scenes in this work are pervaded by a luminous golden light. Of course, that's the beautiful light of Venice during certain times of day, but for me this evokes the experience of refined cosmic consciousness, where a person perceives a golden glow permeating everything. Michael shared that this artwork reflects his spiritual journey to me, Michael's journey has been radiant with beauty, which could be symbolized by the flower at the center of this work. 
and also unified by the golden light of consciousness, always present through all experiences.